Um, so good morning, everyone. So Mike and I are going to tag team this. Um, I'm on the architecture side. Mike's um, on the product management side. And um, Chris really helped set us up because the first thing I actually want to talk about um, as we get started is OpenShift is a platform. Um, Kubernetes is what we kind of think of as a kernel. And the analogy really applies to the idea of a distribution. So today, you go get your Kubernetes, and you add a few things to it, and everything works great. Um, the future is much more complicated than that. And I think that's what, um, as we were starting to see at the end of Chris's slides, we're talking about more and more pieces coming together to help you build these very large software um, platforms for running applications, um, for doing network virtualization. Um, the complexity of these stacks is going to be high. One of the things that we really believe in is the transition from platform to distribution, which is the idea of taking the, p the core pieces of the Kubernetes ecosystem and the projects that exist around that ecosystem, the satellite, those hundreds of open source projects that Diane um, had on her slide, and curating and bringing those um, as they become stable and secure and well integrated, um, focusing on experience, focusing on install management lifecycle. These are really important things to us at Red Hat. We have that experience um, from the Linux kernel. And we think it's a really key part of what OpenShift is, is it's not just a platform, but also a distribution. And just so we can marry the platform to you in the audience, raise your hand if you're from OpenShift Engineering at Red Hat, or you work with Kubernetes. These, uh, these individuals are here to start interacting with you. And if you've never met a sort of a code contributor to the project, this is your opportunity to meet them. Uh, on the customer and the partner in the ISV ecosystem side, how many people are in like financial services or touch money in some way? OK, and how many are like pharmaceutical or manufacturing? And how many are aviation or utilities and telecom? So there's, a, there's typically, a, those are the primary mixes that we see in the customer and in the ecosystem. So definitely talk to each other, and, and we'll, we'll help facilitate that conversation today. OK, so um, there's far too much for us to cover. So Mike and I are going to swiftly cover a massive ecosystem of projects and features and exciting things coming. I will absolutely forget things. Um, and so if you find me or Mike later in the day, come up to us. We're very happy to um, talk to you ad nauseum about everything exciting that's coming in the ecosystem. So community first, that's what Red Hat, um, that's the, the core, the heart of Red Hat, which is about community. So uh, Kubernetes 1.8 was um, bigger than um, the last two releases, Kubernetes 1.7 and 1.6 combined. Um, there's a huge amount of excitement um, around Kubernetes, the project. But a key part of um, what we've been talking about in Kubernetes is Kubernetes as a project needs to grow. And Kubernetes as a project is going to grow by creating 1,000 seeds and sending them off into the wind. It's going to be really important for us to manage this transition from this big monolithic Kubernetes project, which a lot of people think of as, oh, you know, I go get these binaries, and that's Kubernetes. And that is going to change. And how that changes is going to be many more projects working together, collaborating in the open source ecosystem, in much the same way that you see with Linux. Um, the focus for us um, has been on stabilization a lot, but it's also been about forming that, um, that healthy community keeping it going. So the Kubernetes Steering Committee was formed. Um, elections were held uh, a little bit earlier this year. So Kubernetes now has a permanent, or a, um, a one and two year elected term steering committee. And this is a group of people who are intended to help the community move forward. Um, the SIGs in Kubernetes are very important. These are the groups of people who help contribute and drive the project forward in all the different areas, networking, cloud providers, storage. Um, there is a new top-level SIG in the last few months. It's SIG architecture, and this is intended to kind of be a place where um, we can set the direction of Kubernetes, the core, and also help identify what is and what isn't core Kubernetes. And that'll help make that transition, as I talked about, from platform to distribution in the ecosystem. Um, we formalized some of our processes for, or we're working to formalize some of our processes for making change happen in Kubernetes. And this is drafting on many of the same successes and experiences of um, previous large open source projects. You know, typically when we <coughs> go out and talk to users of these technologies, they fall into four camps. <clears throat> One of the camps is, uh, you know, your next generation applications, your microservices. Your, these are typically your line of businesses that are trying to move faster. Um, that's very much greenfield. Then we have a, a large 
brownfield footprint of revenue generating applications that are using technologies today and they have to merge that with what they did yesterday. And then we have next generation IT ops, right? And these women and, and men are trying to reorganize their data centers. Maybe that means moving on premise to a public cloud, maybe that means something else, but they're looking for technologies to help them do that. And then there's the transformational, right? The, the digital, the CTO office and those, those initiatives. When we look at the, that four footprint, we're looking for technologies that we can use to so, help solve all four of those use cases. And a lot of these patterns come out, right? Content is king. If we didn't have the ability to give you this content, then the platform wouldn't really shine. And if the platform didn't shine, we really wouldn't give you a way to have that new content. So we have next generation cloud native services. We have a new concept with our middleware business units. How are they going to have a service on the platform instead of just having an application on the platform? Then we have a lot of low latency next um, HPC evolution type features, which I'll get into a little bit later. We have new models for a developer to work in with their dev flows, and we have a lot of install and upgrade management features to get into in this slide deck. So hold on to your seat and let's get into it. Great. Um, first off, uh, while we're still talking about platform, stability is probably the most important thing. Um, being a reliable foundation, if you don't have a reliable foundation, there's no point to building something on top of it. So all those services that we talked about before, all those features, they depend on having a, a core platform that is stable. So in Kubernetes 1.7 uh, and 1.8 and 1.9, there was a very strong focus on fixing bugs, moving features uh, into stable. Uh, patterns, but there was also another focus, um, and this is something that on the Red Hat side we were very focused on, which was um, production matters and refining and tightening and polishing um, the system at scale in some of the most demanding environments in the world already and making sure that we have a good foundation to build on for the next several years. Um, I'm going to give a couple of examples. Um, most of these are um, some specifics that we got out of our very large uh, OpenShift online environments as well as from customer feedback. Um, Kubernetes relies on events um, as a way of notifying users about what's going on. You see an event stream of um, if your application is uh, crash looping or if you get uh, detached from a node and you get sent someplace else if uh, a build fails for some reason. Um, what we actually realized um, in some of the largest and densest environments that very unhealthy applications were clogging up the pipes. They were sending too many events. And so as part of um, our experience with these very large clusters in our online environments, we actually worked um, in the upstream Kubernetes community to refine and um, put a good pattern in place and to work with others in the community like Google to set kind of a long-term direction for where we wanted events to be. And you know, the actual mechanics are lots and lots of low-level details, but we tried to fit it into that overall whole of what is it going to make both allow people to understand what's going on in the platform at a very fundamental level and keep that core feature in place while continuing to refine it and polish it. Um, a side effect of that was also very dense clusters. So many OpenShift users run extremely dense clusters um, where they're not just running you know, one microservice application with you know, 10 individual components. So they're not running five. They might be running thousands of these applications. And when you have thousands of applications running together, um, there's a lot of metadata and operational policy that comes along with it. And so some of the things that we've worked on over the last year and given a lot of special focus is, we want to anticipate where users are going um, with both Kubernetes and with OpenShift and to lay the foundation so that when we get to these very dense scales, when customers grow to tens of thousands of applications, um, tens of thousands of microservices working together, that all of the groundwork has been paved for them uh, in the, uh, both the open source Kubernetes community and OpenShift. So um, we added a number of features that um, make it easier to deal with very large data sets um, from the API perspective. So anyone who's using an API in Kubernetes will benefit from this. Um, but it also enables some of what I'll talk about in a little bit, which is as we begin to make Kubernetes um, a platform for extension, where people can bring new types of infrastructure APIs. We talked about Istio, we talked about um, Ratalytics. Anyone who's building APIs on top of Kubernetes will also benefit from some of these improvements. So it's just a way to make sure that the effort we invest enables everyone as a platform. Um, monitoring has been a big thing. Um, you know, it's a fair criticism of OpenShift that we didn't initially focus on operational monitoring with some of the built-in product tools. We worked with um, early adopters of, um, of OpenShift um, on their own solutions 
Starting in OpenShift 3.7, um, Prometheus, which is a CNCF project that you'll hear a lot about this week at KubeCon, um, or at uh, this Cloud Native Con, excuse me. Um, you'll see some of, um, you'll see that discussion about Prometheus. Um, Prometheus is a great ad hoc um, near-term metric solution. We've worked in very practical environments to, to integrate Prometheus very deeply to make sure the data is flowing up, but also to keep an eye on those early cases that we knew of where people monitoring the platform, we want that information to flow up, not just into Prometheus, but into cloud forms and some of the other tools and technologies that our um, customers have already built around um, OpenShift. Um, we, we use these metrics to help guide some of these optimizations we've talked about and to really focus on that large scale um, Kubernetes uh, and OpenShift experience. So um, I'm going to jump through some of these um, and leave some time at the end for questions. If you see something here that we skip over, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, we'll make sure some time at the end. Uh, a big part of Kubernetes and of OpenShift is about efficiently using resources, right? That's one of the things that we've always heard from, from users is they're looking to build applications rapidly. But from an operational perspective, they want to make sure that those resources are used effectively. And so a key part of that life cycle is understanding what's running where, which Kubernetes is pretty good at today, but then turning the, the flip side of it, what resources they're using, CPU, memory, disk, and optimizing the platform to ensure that all applications are getting a reasonably fair share. And so there's a lot of work going on in Kubernetes and in OpenShift around this. Um, some of these high-level um, near-term things are about we're really working to standardize kind of the core system metrics. Um, so there have been projects for a long time, you may have heard of Heapster and C Advisor. Um, we're looking to turn those into formal APIs um, so that other components can depend on them, like the scheduler. And we're gonna use that to tie the platform back to itself. So when, um, when you're running very dense clusters, you'll be able to benefit from knowing exactly how much resources are in use at any one point on the cluster and feeding that back in. Um, auto scaling on custom metrics, on application metrics, is also really important to us, and you'll continue to see that uh, evolve over the next, um, the next few months. Extensibility, I touched on this just a few minutes ago, is so fundamental to platform because a platform that isn't extensible has to keep implementing features until it implodes under its own weight. And our goal, really, with Kubernetes is to build um, the mindset of Kubernetes and OpenShift is to be an open platform for building application-focused infrastructure, not infrastructure-focused infrastructure, right? The point of the API is not to go get a VM. The point of the API is to run your applications, and we want it to be easy for people to use those tools to build new APIs that are very application-focused. So um, we talked about Service Mesh with Istio. Um, many of the things that we've been doing on extensibility will be leveraged by the Istio project to add additional service policy to regular Kubernetes applications, to upgrade applications and inject intelligence into this. And as a long-term arc, the more extensible Kubernetes is, the more it becomes much more like the Linux kernel, it becomes a, a key part of the system, but the system is much more than the sum of its parts. Yeah, let's get into some networking. Before I do, how many people are designing or are part of clusters that are under 100 nodes? And then how many are above 250 nodes? Cool. So I'll let you know from a global point of view that in 2016, I would say we had the majority of our population planning for around 100 nodes. 2017, it was really 250 to 500 nodes is the sweet spot right now. And then they're telling us, you're telling us that we should get prepared for the, the sweet spot being 1,000. Right now, we're, we're text, testing maximums at 2,000 nodes per cluster, so you've got a lot of headroom to grow there. Uh, but it really hits back to what Clayton's talking about in the density. When you start getting into these type numbers, and when you start thinking that there's on average between 50 to 70 containers running on any given node, then those are pretty impressive uh, density numbers. On the networking side, there's a lot of, um, as we approach those higher numbers, we start to see some inefficiencies in IP tables that we're working on. So there's a lot of engineering efforts on what is our replacement technologies, and right now it looks like IPVS is, is a forerunner in what uh, we could use to really speed up how the kernel is processing those rules. Um, in terms of the, the network policy itself, how, how many people have tried Kubernetes network policies? 
It's, it's a pretty exciting technology, and if you're, you haven't touched it, please take some time to at least read, read some proposals about it. Um, it allows you to look at pod labels and really control who's initiating traffic to what services. And that really opens the door to a whole new level of granularity control on the network that we've just never had. It's now fully stable in Kubernetes and in OpenShift, so it's something you can definitely take a part of. Where it's growing is on its egress, on how we leave that, that cluster. Uh, there's a lot of uh, clever things coming to bear there. Yeah, and uh, I would actually add to that as well. Um, you know, egress has always been something that we've heard from customers as um, many people are not deploying Kubernetes and OpenShift in isolation, they're integrating these into their existing environments slowly. They're bringing pieces of their infrastructure to bear. And that, that slow addition means that there's many policies and setups that organizations already have in place. And so we spent a lot of our time um, on the OpenShift angle specifically on focusing on how do we make sure that the use cases of, I've got a legacy rack of databases that have very specific firewall policies. How can I make sure that only the appropriate applications connect to those? Because I have a corporate policy that says, this is exactly the, I have a corporate che a security checklist item that says this is how I have to do security for those databases. Mm -hmm. And so taking those kind of, that kind of feedback, working within the Kubernetes ecosystem and building those into OpenShift and other projects in the ecosystem has been a real big focus for us. And in 3.7, we have the ability to have an IP address per project. So now you can really hone down on those firewall rules. And then IPv6, how many people are under the gun to get IPv6 out this year? This uh, 2018 is starting, how many people have to have it in 2018? Yes? About 5% of the room. Well, it's, uh, you must be lying to me when we're on the phone uh, because it's, uh, it's extremely important. Um, you know, it's coming from three areas. It's coming from government, it's coming from telecom, and it's coming from the OpenStack community who just got IPv6 support probably, I think, six months ago or so. We run a lot on OpenStack, and so those synergies are coming together where it's a big enough population for us to really push it forward. I, it is fair to say, though, that we've been mostly held up by the cloud providers. So if all the cloud providers in the room could you know, get, on, get up on their act and get IPv6 support, it would make us a lot happier. On the storage, so stateful sets really came in into its uh, essence in the next, in, I'd say in the last two months or so. We really closed the gap on some core things that were, were left on the table. Uh, that means that those types of applications, those databases are looking typically for local storage, right? They want that high throughput on the host. You don't want to be designing a Kubernetes distributed cluster around where things are physically attached. So the scheduler needed to be made a little more smart about what is connected to those nodes so we can dynamically schedule something based on that. We can still have our PV and our PVC concept, that, that sort of user experience with these local storage devices. And that all completed into alpha stage and it should be ready to use in Kube 1.9, I believe. In, in 3.7, that just came out in November, it's in tech preview, so please, it's in the product, uh, give it a try. The uh, last thing there is resizing and snapshotting. So snapshotting also became tech preview in 3.7. It allows your tenants the ability to go ahead and snapshot their PVs based on the underlying storage technology. So it's a, if it's an AWS, if it's a GPC uh, type thing, you now have that ability to snapshot based on that underlying technology has a tenant on the platform. So definitely take a, take a look at that. And um, you know, overall, um, one of the things that I think um, has been a strong focus for us is that we do deal with the hybrid world, as um, Chris alluded to. Is it's not just software on one side of the equation. It's um, it's a it's a very complicated world, and there's very there's different degrees of demanding applications that need to run. And depending on whether you're running a database or a stateless application, or you're running a machine learning framework, um, what we're trying to do is set a path in Kubernetes for some of these core concepts and allow through extensions and other features to allow more complex solutions to evolve. And um, you know, this, this will continue to evolve, but I, would, I think it's very useful to say that the arc that we're on is to make everything possible and some things very easy and to give people the tools that they need to build much more complex and sophisticated, um, you know, down to the metal cash sharing um, sorts of optimizations are still possible, but it won't be an immediate focus in Kubernetes for the next um, year or so. Thanks.
The, um, we talked a little bit about um, cryo. You know, we think that the container runtime is really important. Uh, we think it's really important that the container runtime be designed to work well with the container orchestrator. And so cryo for us was an opportunity to look at the design of a container runtime and how it fits extremely well with Linux and with Kubernetes and to focus on the kinds of optimizations and release patterns and processes that make sure that no matter what happens every time a Kubernetes release is cut, there's a container runtime that works perfectly with that version of Kubernetes. And so um, over the next um, few months, um, it's in tech preview in OpenShift uh, 3.7, the ability to run cryo on your nodes um, as a container runtime instead of Docker. Uh, we, look, we would look to, over the next few months, we're going to be much more aggressively using this in our very large environments um, testing, and we want to get a lot of really good performance and reliability feedback before we move to the next stage with it. And, and the only design principle we're going after here is to make sure you have choice. So as you, as you start to get into these next generation container runtimes that are more focused on the orchestration layer, we want to make sure that you have the ability to choose one of them. And you'll always have that choice with our solutions. So um, I don't want to rush us, but we have a ton of things in the, you know, the, these are more runtime features. These are details of the platform. They make applications run better. Um, platform features is what really the, the alternative side of this equation is, is what are the things that actually make the world um, of a developer's life easier. Right, and service brokers is a huge part of that. And it's pretty much we're in the age of the service broker at this point. Um, we got very attracted to service brokers because our community wanted us to really give a better user experience to how a tenant connects his or her application services together. That attached itself very rapidly to this age of wanting to bring in cloud-provided services into the data center, and at the same time, house very large corporate services on the platform and allow other tenants to consume them. Those three pools of, of requests came in and formed what we have now called the service catalog in the 3.7 product. Um, service catalog and service brokers, if you're unfamiliar with the concept, and Chris covered it quite nicely with all of his diagrams, it allows you to really design how a tenant is going to bind, unbind, provision, or unprovision a service when he or she wants that in their application. Um, where we need to work on in the next steps is around that last step of injection. Right now we are capturing that in the config maps and in the secrets, and then when you are ready to attach or bind that service to your application, you are given a list of secrets to connect to that service. So we have one more step to automatically do that last step for you. That should come in the uh, next release or so. And then on the granularity, right now all the services are the same for everybody. We want to make sure that Mike Barrett is allowed to have different services than Clayton, and that Mike Barrett's on a different, say, AWS or Azure payment program than Clayton is, because Clayton's a hog when it comes to spending. <laughs> and, um, and just like Service Catalog install and upgrade, I talked about stability and reliability. Um, ensuring that we um, make every upgrade of OpenShift and Kubernetes work extremely well. And you know, I'll, I'll be totally honest, um, you know, OpenShift deals with a large number of very different environments and very different customer requirements, and that is our focus. You know, our installers are intended to work on every cloud provider, on every bare metal platform, everywhere that RHEL runs. And so we have to work through these cases um, and make sure that they're supported as well. So, um, uh, in OpenShift, the next version of OpenShift is actually going to be OpenShift 3.9. It is going to do a rolling upgrade through Kubernetes 1.8 directly into Kubernetes 1.9. Um, and so it's, a, in a sense, a, a catch-up release. Um, that'll be a rolling upgrade, but the goal is um, there's a lot of interesting things in uh, Kubernetes 1.8, but there's even more interesting things in Kubernetes 1.9. We figured it was a good time to, um, to do that. Yeah. And there's a subtlety there. That's a that's us skipping a release for the first time, which meant the installer had to be smart enough to do that behind the scenes for the first time. So I know a, a lot of you in the community wanted to make sure that you could skip releases at some point. Right now we're forcing you to do that serially. This is the first engineering project that solves that for you. And um, a little bit about reference architectures. We're expanding the amount of um, 
examples and guidelines for best practices for installing on the different cloud providers. Uh, a really key initiative underneath that is moving to um, a more cloud-native model on machines. We've always had to bridge that gap between bare metal, where there is no dynamic provisioner for a bare metal box, all the way up through VMs and into cloud providers. Starting with um, OpenShift 3.7, working into OpenShift um, 3.9, there's going to be a lot of focus on um, a cloud-native approach to individual machines, which really just boils down to um, the machines themselves will be stamped out of images. Um, this will be something that we consider standard, the standard standard way we install and deploy. Machines come up, they connect to the cluster, an administrator can either auto-approve them or just run them through the process. They'll join the cluster, and this means that things like auto-scaling and dynamic scaling of your cluster, as well as rolling updates and canary updates of actual new, um, new fields of machines become much easier. And you know, again, this is all about our focus on reducing the operational load. Um, you know, there's a lot of great work in the Kubernetes community that paved the way, and Red Hat continued to invest in those community functions um, and take the next step um, for OpenShift. Because from the very beginning, we have always had very strong security around our nodes, and some of the last bits for that were finally possible in Kubernetes um, 1.7 and 1.8. Management. So the, the product right now, we've always given you the ability to use our Manage IQ open source project. It's uh, productized here at Red Hat, has cloud forms. Um, we've taken it extremely far in this next release. We've podified it. We've run it, made it fully supported in containers. It meets a template deployment pattern on Kubernetes at this point. It is just a management API now on your kube cluster. And this has an amazing amount of features that we can start really pushing into um, operational best practices. It has chargeback. It has the ability to really pull those Prometheus attributes and show them to you in a unique way and connect those to our Ansible Tower product lines and to automate a lot of more sophisticated things for you out of the box. Cloudforms should really help um, dealing with multiple clusters and bringing that information together in a single unified dashboard. So um, we're starting to run a little bit low on time. So um, I'm just going to tease here. Um, there's a ton of great work that's coming in Kuber that's going to come in Kubernetes 1.10. We're going to obviously continue scaling and bug fixes, extensibility and improvements. Um, if I had to say one thing that was really important, again, I'm going to go back to that resource metrics. It's about making the system just work, the autonomous aspects of Kubernetes that will make um, walking away from a cluster and having everything continue to tick over. So even some things that aren't even on this slide, um, Red Hatters have been working on fencing for bare metal and VM environments that'll make it easier to automate um, recovery actions. And there's a ton of work that's gonna go in over the next few releases to tie that, to close that loop between application author intent, the operational platform, the operational policies that administrators have put in place around quota and resource usage and overcommit, and reliability, and tie that back in so that the system can help can do more to manage itself. So let's talk a little. Chris brought this up, so I'll, I'll get a little more deeper into it. When we talk to the OpenShift and the Origin community around serverless, what they're really looking for is, is an opportunity to have a different pricing model, um, and what we can bring to the table by taking a serverless technology like OpenWhisk and bringing it into Kubernetes primitives and making it a user experience with OpenShift is that pricing model. So when you look at function-based computing and you have all your functions designed for your application of microservices, you deploy them out, they hit pods that are running those runtimes, they execute on those pods, now what? Wouldn't it be great if they were able to idle, if they were able to use HPC or uh, HPA, uh, custom metrics, so there's a lot of cost functions that we can do to, to bring them down and bring them back up for you to really, really blend in with the rest of your container environment. And that's what our customers are really asking us to provide with OpenLisk integrations. And I'll note that those are some of the same um, additions, those improvements, idling, resource usage. That's actually something, you know, idling has been in the OpenShift product um, since the 3.2 release. But again, Idling and the ability to reduce resource usage and to spread workload over time is going to be really important. It is going to be a key focus for yeah. us. We were doing it on HTTP, now we're doing it on functions. It's, it's a huge, <laughs> it's an awesome world. Um, application config, this is kind of the idea that 
Config is a very complicated thing. There's many different ways to define applications from the very simple microservice all the way to something like OpenStack. There's no one size fits all solution. Um, an effort that's, under, that's going on in the Kubernetes community is to try and um, blur the lines so that we're using common tools, so that we have common ways of talking about what applications are, and look for patterns um, that can be reused in multiple ways. So if you're deploying giant massive applications, you may want to deploy that giant massive application all at once. If you are a bunch of individual teams, you may want to reuse the same tools that you know, a giant project is using to deploy everything um, in your individual spot. And each individual developer might want uh, the flexibility to customize their tools. And so we'll continue to evolve how applications are defined as kind of a, a long arc. Um, we don't think this is um, by any means the end of where we'll go with configuration and application configuration. We want to give people the tools they need to, um, to build applications and maintain them over time. I think this is the last one, hopefully. The uh, Istio, how many people are going to go to an Istio talk this, this week? I think uh, a third of the uh, conference material is on Istio <laughs> from when I look through the agenda. So it's, um, it's a pretty popular technology. From our Red Hat point of view and what we're talking to our customers, it falls into either a north-south or an east-west conversation. And on the north-south, we've been championing HA proxy for quite some time, and we have a list of requirements that people have wanted us to close the gap on. And these next generation lightweight web proxies close a lot of those requirements for us, right? We get to dynamically change URLs, we get to change certs in a much more automatic fashion. So it's a, it's a huge leap there. Uh, it also does HTTP2, which is uh, coming up quite a bit. Uh, on the east-west, this, um, this is interesting, right? If, who would have ever thought that you were going to put a web proxy in the front of every single application service? That would be insane if you didn't have containers and if you didn't have a container platform to accomplish that, right? That would, that's voodoo. You don't, you don't put a web proxy in front of every um, application service. But if you did do that, holy cow, look at all the things that fall out of it, right? Now, now you, can, you can meter it, you can control who has the ability, you know, privacy, there's um, circuit breaker concepts, and it solves the number one thing that Netflix and its OSS components failed to solve, thou shall not make the application developer develop to the platform, right? That was the number one cardinal rule, and Istio solves that for us. The, the, ad, the, the tenant can now be blind to uh, a lot of those things. Okay. So um, we know there's probably questions. Um, Diane is uh, certainly giving me the, uh, the evil eye up there. Uh, if you'd like to catch us after the session, be more than happy to talk. And uh, Mike and I will be around all day. So we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks.